Hi folks, Dick Coughlin here, how are you? Back with another video for you. And this is going to be a video response to some tweets. Now you might be thinking that's a, this seems a bit of a heavy video, a bit of a longish video to necessarily be about some tweets. But you see, sometimes you meet, you see on Twitter, uh, you know, these people who have this very good skill of managing to cram something into a mere couple of hundred characters that is so, so just rammed full of such immense crap that it takes sometimes a long time to unravel it all. And I'm going to try and do that in this video. Now this video is going to be directed at a user who only recently, and for reasons you can probably figure out, uh, came under my radar, who goes by the name of Chris Raygun. Now I want to preface this by saying I know very little about Chris Raygun. I have tried to keep myself sort of slightly distant from a lot of his stuff. I wanted to focus mainly on the actual things that he said here that I'm going to be responding to in this video. And this this might seem like a bit long and drawn out, but unfortunately, this is a complex issue. It's not something you can sum up in a soundbite. So please forgive me if I'm a little bit, you know, if I'm a, if I seem to be a little bit overly analytical here, but that's life unfortunately. Now a little while ago, Chris Reagan posted on his Twitter account the following tweet. Words that no longer have any meaning left whatsoever. Sexist, racist, bigot, white supremacist, Nazi. The future is fucked. Now, there's a couple of things I need to say here. Now, first of all, I, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here, Chris. And I'm going to talk to you on the assumption you might watch this video. Now, Chris, I don't know you from a bar of fucking soap, mate. And so I want to make this perfectly clear. At no point in this video am I going to suggest or directly call you any of those fucking things. I don't want to do that. And I also want to preface by saying that actually, in a way, you are kind of right in the sense that I do agree that there are people who just jump to, very quickly, they jump to the Nazi, the bigot, the white racist, the white supremacist, whatever card, and they throw that at you without even responding to what you've said. That does exist. However, let us make something clear here. Just because some words get misused or overused does not render them useless or meaningless. What it means is there's lots of people out there who necessarily, who maybe just have different views on what constitutes somebody being any of those things. Or maybe it's people who have misread or misunderstood something you've said, but it could also mean that maybe you have misread or misunderstood something that you've said. Now, I don't wish to be patronising here. This is not a case of you're too stupid to know what you're saying. This is something that we all have to be aware of. This is something that not many people are aware of. I'm only aware of it because I've spent the last nine fucking years dealing with these people and it hopefully over the course of this video I'm going to show you exactly what I mean by that. But also let me say this. The meaning and gravity of a word is not just made, uh, is not just watered down because people over use it or misuse it. Another reason that a word can be, you know, watered down and become rendered meaningless is through statements like that one that you've just made. You are announcing that these words, sexist, bigot, racist, Nazi, white supremacist, have no meaning. They have been rendered meaningless. If you're saying that, what you are telling your subs your followers and what you are expressing of yourself is that, hey, if you ever see anyone using any of those words to describe another person, it doesn't mean anything. And I think, hopefully, Chris, we can both agree that that's not true, is it? Just because a word is overused or misused, or just because you don't personally like it, does not render it meaningless. And it should not be announced and try, you should not try and promote the idea that just because some people do that, that they should dismiss any and every example of ever being used. Whatever your views are, Chris, I'm pretty sure that you would agree with me that there are people in the world who are Nazis, who are racist, who are bigots, who are sexist, who are white supremacists, and that that label perfectly applies to them. Also, let's not pretend, Chris, for one minute, that this 
uh, uh, declaration that you've made is not kind of centred around yourself. I've got a funny feeling that the reason you think that those words have been rendered meaningless is because those are things that you probably get called quite a lot. I'm just going out on a limb here, but I'm pretty sure that you think that, that, that those words get thrown at you a lot. Now, I don't know whether they're fair or not. Like I said, I don't know what's in your heart here. What I want to do is show you why sometimes that may be the case. Not all, but sometimes. But let's also let, uh, ask yourself this. How many other words are misused or rendered meaningless by people say, you know, by people who engage in this kind of ad hominem debate? How many times have you thrown the word SJW at people in a derogatory manner? Do you not think that renders that one a little bit meaningless? I've lost fucking track of the amount of times I get called a, a SJW, white knight, or a, a, or a fucking, or, or a mangina, or a, or a cuck, right? And I don't like being called a cuck. That's unfair. The only person who's allowed to call me a cuck is my wife. And even she, only, at least she only has the good grace to only ever call me a cuck when she's fucking another man, right? So let's let's so let's be fair here. But let's not just look at those words. Let's look at all other words. What about communist? How many times does that get thrown out at people? How many times do people throw out the word communist, Marxist, cultural Marxist? Even general words, even everyday little words that we use, like like epic. How many times do you have see someone call use the word epic? And it's describing something completely... Look at clickbait articles that you get. Look at this awesome tweet that so-and-so sent out. It's bullshit, okay? People go right for the top shelf on everything these days. To render it down to those specific fucking words kind of is a little bit ignorant. Because I will admit those words get misused, but you have to also accept that maybe you do it too. Maybe other people do it too. But that doesn't render any of those words meaningless. So Chris, what I want to do now is talk to you quickly about, about things like racism and such and such in the modern era. Now the problem with racism... Uh, specifically. Now, I'm going to use racism mainly here as the word, but racism ties in with the word bigot, white supremacist and Nazi, so I'm going to sort of use that word specifically. The thing about racism these days is it's not like it was in the good old days. In the good old days, racists were pretty fucking upfront and very, very clear. These people are not white, these people are subhuman, they should be, at best, at best, they should be kicked out of the country. At worst, they should be hung from a tree and burnt alive. It was very, very simple. Nobody made a, made a fucking fuss about it. The same goes with all other forms of bigotry. Homophobia, xenophobia, sexism, anti-Semitism. These things were all very upfront. But then something happened in the world. The world became a little bit more tolerant. The world became a little bit more inclusive or at least our world became a little bit more inclusive and accepting of people from different walks of life, people with different lifestyles, people who just stood out and were easy targets for bigots and people looking for someone to make scapegoats and victimizers. But because of the fact that we became more tolerant, all of these bigots learnt something. Because there might be bigots, they're not stupid. They learnt they could no longer be as upfront as they wanted to be. So they had to find a different way. There's an expression that is used in the modern era, I'm sure you're aware of it, it's called dog whistle. Uh, and it refers to when somebody is saying something in order as a sort of nod and a wink to a certain group without actually fully coming out and saying it. One other thing you'll notice is that these days people who are bigots tend to play the victim now. They've, they've swapped from being the people who are the open oppressors calling for the oppression of people to people who are actually claiming that they're being oppressed. In the old days, it used to be a case of if you hated gay people, it was these people are disgusting, they created AIDS, they want to fuck your kids. It was very clear. These people are evil, sick and wrong. But now you can't do that anymore. Now you can't come out and say that because you'll get shouted down by a bunch of virtue signalling SJWs on Twitter. So what you end up having to do is you now have this situation whereby people who are homophobes now claim that they're the ones being oppressed. You'll see this with religious freedom bills and stuff like that. People who own businesses who want to discriminate against gay people. And now they're actually turning it into a case of we're the ones being oppressed. Our religious values are being oppressed. You see that 
all the time, right? This is how, these are the two ways you market it. You either market it through dog whistles and code words, or you market it through we're the oppressed ones. Now, before anyone sits there and thinks that I'm being a little bit conspiratorial and accusing people of saying things that they haven't actually said, and that sounds a little bit paranoid, you're right. It does sound that way. But luckily, I don't have to uh, go into too much detail to show you that this is what the peop these people think. Now, let me give you some examples, first of all. Now, recently in the UK, there is a, there was a woman called Katie Hopkins, who is a vile, toxic shit fountain of a human being. In fact, I've got a video that I've uh, been working on that's coming up next after this one that will be about Katie Hopkins. Anyway, Katie Hopkins is a horrible human being, and she recently lost her job uh, on a radio station called LBC. And she lost it uh, on, a, on account of the fact that she said something on Twitter following uh, the Manchester terror attacks that happened at an Ariane Grande concert uh, not too long ago. Now, I'm going to read to you the tweet that she sent out. Now, I'm going to see if you can spot it first. We'll give you a minute. This is what Katie Hopkins was referring to. She said, uh, 22 dead, number rising. Don't be part of the problem. We need a final solution. Can you spot that one? That's a pretty easy one there, isn't it? We need... A final solution. Now, she did try and backtrack and delete the tweet. Um, but when she was questioned about it, she turned around and said, Oh, no, I stand by what I said in the tweet. I deleted it because I misspelt Manchester in the hashtag. Because that's the reason. That was the offensive part of that tweet. Not the, we need a final solution part. Now, Chris, I am not going to insult your intelligence by assuming by assuming or talking to you as if you don't know what final solution means but if someone's watching this video and you're young and you don't know what final solution means go on google images and type it in you'll get some very very heart rendering and wonderfully lovely images pop up right and also a picture of katie hopkins i imagine as well now when katie hopkins says that she is not fucking stupid she appeals to, and she appeals to an audience who is, and she acts it, but she is not stupid. There is no way any human being who is involved in politics or journalism in this day and age does not know exactly what the term final solution means. Everyone knows what it means. She can turn around and claim that I didn't know, I did, I, that was not my fault. But the fact is, when you say, we need a final solution, she is speaking to a certain audience who know exactly what that fucking means. Now, let me give you another example. This involves a guy called Tommy Robinson, and he and I go way back, right? way, way, way back, me and Tommy. Tommy Robinson, fascist Elmo, former leader of the English Defence League, former BMP member as well. We'll get onto them in a little bit. He is a classic for using dog whistle racism and trying to speak his way around it and trying to sort of say things without fully saying it. There's deniability within the actual statements he makes, but if you've got any common sense, you know that some coincidences, the odds on them being, being a coincidence are just far too fucking ridiculous. Now, recently we had a general election in this country, um, and the day before the general election, Tommy Robinson sent out this tweet. If you vote Labour, expect a terrorist for a neighbour. Some of you in the UK who know about your politics might think that sounds a little bit familiar. Now, Chris, I'm going to assume you probably don't know it familiar, but let me show you what, as soon as I read that, and as soon as a lot of other people read that, they knew exactly where that came from. And it's this. This is a poster campaign for the Tory government from the 1960s. If you desire a coloured for a neighbour, vote Labour. If you already burdened with one, vote Tory. Now, when Tommy Robinson tweets out, if you want a terrorist for a neighbour, vote Labour, that is the audience he's talking to. The audience who those fucking uh, 1960s uh, leaflets were targeted at. He knows that. There is no way on earth a man who has been associated with as many right-wing organisations as Tommy Robinson, whose entire life has been steeped in this kind of fucking, this kind of culture, cannot know 
that fucking phrase. He knows that. He knows it and he throws it out. But it's not the only time he's done it. Let me give you another example. This was something he tweeted out a long time ago. In fact, it's from June 2013. There was a sort of vandalising of a mosque in a place called Muswell Hill. Someone had someone had vandalised the mosque and there had been spray painted on the wall of this mosque, uh, in, you know, spray painted the words EDL. Tommy Robinson sent out this tweet. I'm sceptical about hashtag Muswell Hill. And then you see a little thing they're saying, Mohammed Mosque, oh, very original. And it says, hey, Imam, what you doing? Now, the drawing looks a bit odd. As you can see, this is the uh, classic Mohammed with the bomb for a turban cartoon that we've all seen before. But the rest of the uh, but the rest the rest of this image is actually Photoshop. The body of that is not the original body. Let me show you the original poster that that came from. There it is, the Shalom Temple. Hey Rabbi, what you doing? And someone drawing a swastika. This was from a campaign that was very, very clearly stating that vandalizing the, the stories coming out that uh, that um, Jewish temples uh, were being vandalized and swastikas were being spray painted on them was actually being done by Jews. Jewish rabbis and other people were deliberately vandalizing their own their own property. <coughs> Tommy Robinson knows about that poster. He must have done because he's used the same image and just photoshopped a picture of Mohammed with a bomb for a turban over it. That is the audience he's talking to. This is what people mean when they say dog whistle racism. But here's the thing, not everyone who engages in it is necessarily engaging in it knowingly. Because one of the tactics of these people is what they do is they, they basically hijack certain words and they hijack certain phrases. As you said at the start, all of these words, racist, bigot, white supremacist, Nazi, these words are thrown about so much it feels meaningless. Well, there's a reason that one of the reasons they get thrown around a lot, and I say one of the reasons, not the only reason, one of the reasons they get thrown around a lot is because a lot of people don't realise they are speaking a language that these people are attempting to hijack. And lots of people, whether they want to or not, whether they realise it or not, whether they're doing it knowingly or unknowingly, consciously or subconsciously, these people are actually attracting and drawing in these pe these other people. In fact, the it's better for these people if the people who are using this language that they have hijacked don't actually fucking know. Because then it's harder for them to fucking accept this. It's harder for them to accept that they have they have generated a huge su su a substantial or even a majority audience you know, who are made up of these horrible right-wing fucking extremists. But it does exist. In fact, these people will admit to it. For example, I'm sure you're familiar with a guy called Richard Spencer, right? Now, the words white supremacist, my friend, certainly is not meaningless when we're talking about Richard Spencer. Neither is the word Nazi, neither is the word bigot, neither is the word racist. Sexist, I don't fucking know. I don't know enough, but I, you know, I'll go on a limb and say I wouldn't be fucking surprised. Let's have a look at that, shall we? Well, this is a tweet that Richard Spencer sent out in October 2016. I've said over and over that Milo, Yarnopolis, Sargon of Akkad, Lauren Souther, mm, and Gavin McGuinness types it's not even coherent, this. Types people can be great entry points. Now, I'm assuming he doesn't mean, like, physical entry points. That would be hideous. What he's saying there is that these people are a great tool for people like him. They're not necessarily on the same side as him. In fact, they might completely and utterly disavow people like Richard Spencer. The fact of the matter is... That what he's, what he's telling you is that these people are good tools for people like him. They attract an audience and they get people to a point where people like him can swoop in under the fucking radar. Right? Maybe not as much him now because he's a little bit more well known. But he can swoop in under the radar and come in using the same language as them but using it in a very different way. Now, again, I don't want you to think, if you think that I'm being paranoid and conspiratorial, let me give you the best example. I'm going to play you a clip now of, uh, and it's a, it's a clip from two th the year 2000. That's, this is 17 years ago. This is a clip of a guy called Nick Griffin. Nick Griffin is the former leader of the British National Party, who previous to that was in the National Front. 
Um, he is a well-known and admitted Holocaust denier, white supremacist, Hitler lover. This is not an unambiguous, this is not a meaningless statement when I throw those words at him. If you don't know much about him, look him up. He's a pretty nasty son of a bitch. But anyway, this is a video of him in the year 2000. He went to America. Uh, he went to do a, a speech for a little organization in America called the Ku Klux Klan. And this is uh, the year 2000 when the Ku Klux Klan was being uh, led by David Duke. Now, David Duke and the Ku Klux Klan, David Duke has split paths with the Ku Klux Klan now. He's gone off on his own. Right? But this is Nick. Now, listen to what Nick Griffin is telling you in this in this video, it's very important, right? And this is how, this isn't just apply to Nick Griffin, because he's talking about it in America. What he's saying here is very important. So pay attention, I'll play the clip and we'll come back later. Beside Mr. Griffin sat David Duke. Mr. Duke is a former leader of the Ku Klux Klan, an organization with a violent history of lynchings and murders of blacks. Nick Griffin confided in his right-wing audience that he and his party had a new strategy to sell their ideas to the British people. There's a difference between selling out your ideas and selling your ideas. And the British National Party isn't about selling out its ideas, which are your ideas too, but we are determined now to sell them. And that means basically to use these saleable words, as I say, freedom, security identity, democracy. Nobody can criticize them. Nobody can come at you and attack you on those ideas. They are saleable. Perhaps one day, once by being rather more subtle, we've got ourselves in a position where we control the British broadcasting media, then perhaps one day the British people might change their mind and say, yes, every last one must go. Perhaps they will one day. But if you hold it out as your sole aim to start with, you're going to get absolutely nowhere. So, instead of talking about racial purity, you talk about identity. He's right there. Did you hear that? He is telling you right then and there. We're not going to say racial purity. We're going to say identity. We're going to talk about heritage. We're going to talk about freedom. We're going to talk about democracy. Those are the words we're going to use. And if we use those words, and if we market ourselves under that banner... We are going to, that's how we're going to get somewhere. Now, you might sit there and think, well, Richard, the BMP is pretty much dead and buried now. Well, this is not about the BMP. What he's talking there is about selling the ideas so that one day, maybe, the British public will buy into them a bit more. And let's see whether or not they did. Right? Because believe it or not, Nick Griffin, what he did there was very important. Right? In fact, it has changed the face of British politics right here, right now, that we live in today. Simply by changing the little softer words, he's now managed to hijack British politics, even though he's completely irrelevant. A recent article in the Metro newspaper actually discovered that when you look at the BMP's 2005 manifesto, what they discovered was a lot of the actual policies that were in the BMP's 2005 manifesto, which is the manifesto they would have written directly after that kind of that speech he made, were are now part of mainstream fucking policy. Their policies on immigration, on leaving the EU, bringing back grammar schools, you know, so th these are mainstream political uh, political policies that are held within the government we've currently got. Now, how did they get there? Well, one of the reasons they got there was UKIP. You see, the problem with the BMP is that the BMP, their history was always going to be a burden for them. They were intertwined in a way that could not be denied with groups, you know, with groups like the National Front and the, the British Union of Fascists, right, led by Oswald Mosley. But then, luckily enough, UKIP came along. Now, what did UKIP do? Well, according to Nigel Farage himself, in an interview in, uh, in uh, just last year, a couple of years ago, Nigel Farage, Nigel Farage said this, I am proud to have taken the BMP supporters. He talks, I'll leave a link to the article below, it's an interview in the, in the Telegraph, and he said this in, in an interview last year as well. He boasts that I killed the BMP. How did he kill the BMP? He killed them 
by appealing to their supporters. And Nigel Farage managed to become so popular that the conservative mainstream party decided, hey, we'll take that as well. In fact, Nigel Farage himself is quoted recently on Twitter back in January. I'll read it myself. Here it is. I can hardly believe that the PM is now using phrases and words that I've been mocked for using for years. He has openly stated that the Tory party's latest manifesto is in many parts just a rehash of his 2010 manifesto. And his 2010 manifesto was a rehash of the fucking BMP's 2005 manifesto. The BMP being the party of the led by the guy you just saw who's talking about racial purity. Now, that is what's important here. Now, you're probably wondering at this stage, Chris, what the fuck has this got to do with you? Well, I'll explain that. But before I do explain that, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Hi there. I'm Richard the Dick Coughlin. I don't know if you're like me. Handsome, talented, accomplished. <laughs> Isn't it boring? Well, one thing I'm not is rich. And that's how you can help. If you go to the description box below, you'll see the top link is to my Patreon page. If you want to see more videos like this on a more regular basis, then you simply have to go down there and give me all your money. It's very fucking simple. Why won't you do it? Fuck starving people, fuck the homeless, and fuck the needy. I'm here doing the hours, putting the work in. Anyway. Back to the video. Now, hopefully, at this point, you're all very much aware of the premise I'm trying to set up here, and that is that these days, racism is not what it appears to be. It's not as upfront, it's not as honest, and what it needs to be is saleable, as Nick Griffin said. It needs to be using language that makes it sound softer. And the, by doing this, what it means is, is that these people who have these nefarious agendas can hijack certain words, certain phrases and concepts, and they can get them out into the general lexicon of our language. So that when we use certain phrases and certain language, whether we mean it to or not, it is a dog whistle. It is calling those people over and those people will go, will either go, hey, this guy is speaking our language, let's go with him, or worse, they'll think, hey, this guy's on our side. And Chris, this is where you come in. Now, I want to make it clear once again, I'm not saying that this was your intention or this is what you wanted. I'm just trying to explain to you this is the reality of the situation. Because a little while ago, not that long ago, you sent out the following set of tweets. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them. These are from March 2017. But let's, so let's look at these tweets. Now, I don't know what Stephen King's baby premise is. Right, but let's, so let's ignore that because that's not relevant to the conversation. Right, you say, I do find it odd that multiculturalism is really only being championed by white majority nations. Like everyone else is fine with Asia, Africa, India being majority native, but it's a weird, it's weird this problem, but it's this weird problem in America and Europe for some reason. Honestly, I don't give many shits about who lives where. I just want people to have consistent beliefs. Is that really so difficult? You know, I don't care. I, look, I don't care. I ain't bothered. I'm not. I, you live wherever you want. But just damn it, why are we so diverse? I mean, I'm not bothered. I don't care. It's not an issue. Right? It's not fucking. It's, it's, I really, I'm really not concerned. I'm just not bothered by it whatsoever. Damn it, why? So let's dissect this one, shall we? Now, why on earth would anyone equate that with any kind of white nationalist or racist thinking. Well, the key word there, Chris, is within the fact that you think that only white majority nations embrace the idea of multiculturalism. Now, here's the first thing you've got to understand, is if you're talking specifically just about the word multiculturalism, then yeah, it is really only white nations because it's a word that hasn't been around very long and it's a word that only we use in the world. It's, an, it's a word that doesn't really translate in many other, many other cultures, right? They have multiculturalism, diversity, if you will, in various forms, but they don't call it multiculturalism. And the specific part of, the, uh, part of your tweet there is where you go, Africa, I, it's Asia, Africa, India being majority native. But it's a weird problem for white majority nations. That, Chris, unfortunately, is almost word for word verbatim uh, part of what is called the mantra. 
Now, the mantra was invented by a guy called Bob Whittaker. Bob Whittaker is usually credited with creating what's called the White Genocide Conspiracy. That is a conspiracy that suggests that there is actually a, a there is actually an active conspiracy uh, amongst the elites of the world or whatever to eradicate white people by forcing them to live with people who are not white and then somehow brainwashing them into you know into believing that they have to mix with these people you know uh, so if you've ever had sex with someone who isn't your if you're a white person and you fucked a black person or someone who's not white uh, that's political correctness gone mad i mean that's that that's literally what it is now bob whitaker uh, it's, it's it's interesting timing this because bob whitaker uh, recently died and uh, what a fucking hypocrite, eh? He goes on about white genocide, then the cunt goes and dies. What a fucking mook. But anyway, Bob's, Bob Whittaker created what was called the mantra. Now, Bob Whittaker is a white supremacist, right? He is a white nationalist, whatever you want to call it. He was, uh, at one point, he was the leader of what was called the American Third Position, which sounds like a weird sex move. But the American Third Position was a political party, and they're... they're their manifesto contains such nuggets as this. The American third position exists to represent the political interests of white Americans. We want America that is recognisable to us that we feel comfortable in. The initial basis of our upstart organisation is the racial nationalist movement. It has been in disarray for the last 20 years, so there's not as large a bay for us to draw from. What specifically does this have to do with what you say? Well, Bob's mantra, I'm not going to read it in full. I actually did a couple of videos of about this um, in 2010. So that shows how far this has fucking grown. That shows how much this has spread. Uh, this is what basically, uh, this is basically the parts of it that are relevant. Everybody says there is a race problem. Everybody says this race problem will be solved when the third world pours into every white country and only white countries. Everybody says the final solution to this race problem is for every white country and only white countries to assimilate, i.e. intermarry, with all those non-whites. And then the most important part, Asia for the Asians, Africa for the Africans, white countries for everybody. That right there, Chris is exactly what you have just said. I'm not saying, again, I cannot emphasise this enough, I am not saying that is what you intended, but that is what you've just said. You've just said, Asia for Asians, Africa for Africans, white countries for everyone, why is it only white countries that only have to deal with this shit, deal with this problem? Problem! You use the word problem in your fucking... It's a problem, right? They call it a problem in this... This is what you said. You have just said something that is, that is part of the white supremacist dogma. And you've just said it. And when you say that... You're bringing these people into it. Unfortunately, Chris, that is your problem. That is a problem you have to accept and deal with. The way you are talking is you are talking like these people. And I understand. It's annoying when you get people who tell you uh, and call you things that you're not. And maybe in your eyes misrepresent your position. And maybe you don't even realise it. But the fact of the matter is, Chris... With that tweet right there, you are speaking white nationalists' language. You are speaking the language of racists. You're speaking the language of Bob Whittaker, a ma the man who wrote it. The man who led a political party that wanted to p secure a white nation. Now, if that's not what you want, if that is not what you intend, the only person who can solve that problem is you. There are two things you can do. You can either publicly disavow all of these people who have these extreme right-wing views, who have these racist views. You can either disavow them unequivocally, or, on top of that, you can think more carefully about the language you use. Now, whenever I say this, we always get people who sit here and go, oh, so we have to change the way we talk just because all these racists and bigots are talking like it. No, you don't have to change the way you talk at all. But if you are going to talk like these people, they are going to latch onto you. This is what they do. And I've already shown you 
right there. I've already given you proof in this video that this is what they want. And I've already shown you that that is what is happening right now. The BMP 2005 manifesto is the fucking Tory manifesto of 2017. These ideas have been latched on and are winning. If you don't want to be part of that, you have to do something about it. That's on you. We all have to fucking take responsibility for what we fucking say, right? And so maybe, Chris, maybe one of the things you can do, if you don't like it when people call you a racist or people call you a sexist or people call you a, a bigot or a white nationalist, maybe a good idea to start would be to stop talking like one. Now, not a lot of people know this. Not a lot of people know this language. You are, you know, I'm perfectly willing to believe that you said all these things in good faith without realising what you were saying. But that is what a dog whistle does, mate. Not all dog whistles are blown consciously. But let me get on to now the factual aspect of what you actually wrote. Everyone's fine with Asia Africa, India being majority native, but it's this weird problem in America and Europe for some reason. First of all, there's a problem with the three examples you've listed. Two of them are continents. The third one is a country that is part of the first continent you mentioned. So what you're saying is Asia, Africa and India. Do you have any idea of the vast areas that, that those, those all cover? You do know that Asia is not a country, that Africa is not a country, that India is a country. And my curiosity is, when you said Asia and Africa, is that what you really meant? Did you mean Asia? Or did you mean Asia as in the people who look Japanese, Chinese, that South? Did you mean Southeast Asian? When you said Africa, did you mean Africa or did you mean black? Because that's the only way any of those, that, that, those three examples make sense, is if you're using them to say something else. But the problem here, Chris, is this is a classic example of what you would call ethnocentric thinking. You think that the world you live in is so fucking different and so fucking special. And all the other countries are di and everywhere else in the world, it's all completely different. What are you actually saying? Let's have a look for a start at the areas that are covered in Africa. Right? These are the countries that exist in Africa. Algeria, Angola, Benin, Botswana, Burkina Faso, Burdini, Cabo Verde, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, Comoros, the, Dem the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Republic of Congo, Côte d'Ivoire, that's the Ivory Coast, Djibouti, Egypt, the Equatorial Guinea, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Gabon, Gambia, Ghana, Gu Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Ka Kenya, Lesotho, Liberia, Libya, Madagascar, Malawi, Mali, Mauritania, Mauritius, Morocco, Mozambique, Namibia, Niger, Nigeria, Rwanda, Sao Tome and Principe, Senegal, Seychelles, Sierra Leone, Somalia, South Africa. Yeah, there's no fucking, there's no, there's no diversity in South Africa, is there? South Sudan, Sudan, Swaziland, Tanzania, Togo, Tunisia, Uganda, Zambia, Zimbabwe. Are you aware of the vast amount of diversity? Now, I know in your mind, you might think you can't tell the difference of a geezer from Gambia or a geezer from Ghana and a geezer from Botswana. They fucking can. I know that we can't always tell the difference between sometimes between a Chinese bloke and a Japanese bloke, or, you know, is that a Japanese bloke, is that an Eskimo, or is that a Japanese, is that a Chinese bloke with a fucking woolly coat on? I, no, I know that you don't, but then I can't tell fully the difference between someone who's got a Canadian accent and someone who's got an American accent, but generally they fucking can. I know that it might seem same to you, same to you, but it's not, right? Let's have a look more, let's have a look at Asia, right? Here are the countries that are included in Asia. Right, you want to talk about diversity. These are Asian countries. Afghanistan, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Bahrain, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Brunei, Cambodia, China, Cyprus, Georgia, Indonesia, I Iran, India, Iraq, Israel, fucking Israel, Japan, Jordan, Kazakhstan, Kuwait, Kyrgyzstan, Laos. Lebanon, Malaysia, Maldives, Mongolia, Myanmar, also known as Burma, Nepal, North Korea, <coughs> Oman, Pakistan, Palestine, the Philippines, Qatar, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, South Korea, Sri Lanka, Syria, Taiwan, Tajikistan. Turkey, Turkmenistan, the United Arab Emirates, Uzbekistan, Vietnam, Yemen. How much more diversity do you fucking want, my friend? You know, that is a pretty diverse group. You've got China, 
Japan, Israel, Russia. You've got the Middle East. You've got... I mean, that is a pretty diverse fucking area there. What do you expect? What do you mean... Uh, you know, Israel, how, long, how old is Israel as a country? How old are all a lot of these other countries? And you're talking about diversity. Now, I know North Korea is the is not a mono, is not really diverse. But mono, North Korea is the only example you could give of a country that has a monolithic fucking entity. is a monolithic entity and it, in terms of its, its ethnic demographics, in terms of cultural and, uh, and ethnic diversity. Do you realise how fucking b big that an area that is he's covered there? Are you telling me that Thailand and Cyprus and and Kazakhstan and Russia are all are, are all the same? Oh, they're all the same. They're all fucking. It's all. There's no divert. So what did you mean when you said Asia, right? What did you mean when you said fucking Asia, right? And if you think there's no diversity in any of these places, right? You should look at. Here's some. Let me put this up. Right, this is from the Lowry Institute. This is about religious diversity in Southeast Asia. Right, as you can see in Brunei, majority of people are Muslim, about eighty fucking percent of them. And as you can see next to it, Myanmar, they're eight, they're about eighty ninety percent Buddhist. Cambodia is about ninety five percent Buddhist. Then you have got Laos. Laos is only about sixty percent Buddhist, and then it's got uh, no, and then it's got traditional, which is a you know, which is to do with more sort of traditional religions that are connected with that area. That's a multitude of religions, of minority religions in there. Then you've got other countries, you've got countries that are... Right, you've got Malaysia. Malaysia, again, mostly Muslim, but it's also got a lot of Buddhist in there, and some and some Hindu, and some Hindu. Then you've got the Philippines. That is mostly fucking Christian, with a little bit of fucking Muslim thrown in. Then you've got Singapore, which is a complete fucking mess over there. There's just a bit of everything in that one. Thailand, Thailand, which is basically all fuck. You've got Thailand, which is mostly Buddhist with a little bit of Muslim, and then you've got Vietnam, which is mostly tra which has got traditional, and then just under that, unaffiliated. Affiliated, and then you got Timor Leste, which is, to be fair, is not a massive fucking country, but that is one hundred percent fucking Christian. You're telling me that's not diversity? There's not diversity there, and the demographics are not too dissimilar to the ones we get to the to the uh, you know ones we have in Britain, in Europe, and in America. You know, you generally tend to get 60, 70, 80 percent Christian, and the rest are all minority. That's but even a country like Israel, even a country like Israel. 80% of Israel is Jewish, right? I know everyone thinks it's 100% Jewish, but no, I know there are other issues connected with that. But the fact of the matter is, it's still 80% Jewish. So these these demographics are pretty universal throughout the whole fucking issue. Right, here's an interesting one for you. This is from Pew, this is from Pew Research. I'll leave a link to this below. This is a map that talks about cultural diversity. They actually did a study to find out what countries have the most culturally diverse. Do you know what's the most culturally diverse area in the fucking world, my friend. Africa. In fact, looking for a real multicultural experience? Head to Chad in North Central Africa, where 8.6 million residents belong to 100 ethnic groups, or to Togo, home of 37 tribal groups who speak 39 languages. In this, I know that because in America and in Britain, everyone, you know, to you, everyone who's different is different. And maybe when you look over there, <coughs> Like I said, you can't tell the difference between one culture and another, but they fucking can. And I know to you their languages all sound a little bit similar, but to them they don't. Right? I'll leave a link to this below and you'll see right through it. In fact, you'll also notice that some of the least culturally diverse areas, uh, America actually is in the middle when it comes to cultural diversity. Uh, Canada and Mexico are more culturally diverse than the US. Right? Canada and Mexico are more culturally diverse than America. Right? But the but as you can see from that map, the most fucking diverse areas in the fucking world are actually, in terms of culture, are in Africa, my friend. Right? But let's not talk just about culture. Let's talk about us. This is from the Harvard Institute of Economic Research. They did a study to find out what are the most and least ethnically diverse countries in the world. And let me bring up the map just to show you. Oh, bugger me with a fish fork. Look at that. It's Africa. And where's America? Oh, look, America is right in the fucking middle. And if you go look over in Europe, you can see actually Europe is some of the more ethnically more ethnically homogenous or least ethnically diverse. Um, it's actually fucking Africa again. Africa has got more, uh, has got more ethnic diversity than the rest of the fucking world. Right? Certainly more than Europe and certainly more than fucking America. 
Right. So we've already established that Africa is more culturally diverse. Africa is more uh, ethnically diverse. So my question to you is, Chris, on what basis do you make a statement that Africa and Asia are not diverse areas, are not areas that have multiculturalism? And now I know that there are countries within there. There are countries within there that don't necessarily embrace or allow people to have a cultural to, to embrace their culture and express their culture. They don't allow people to have different religions. They don't allow people to speak different languages. But let me ask you this: Do you want to fucking be like that? Do you want a country? Do you live in a country where we tell people, "Oh, you can't do this. You can't do that." You can't believe that. You can't believe this. You can't pray to that God. You can't wear those clothes. You can't watch this TV program. You can't do this dance. This is what it's like for people who live in some of these other countries. Do you want it to be more like that? Or do you want them to be more like us? What do you want? You said it's a problem. You called it a problem. Well, if it's a problem for us, it's obviously a problem for them too. right? This is not a debate here on this issue, Chris. What you've said there... When you say that Asia and Africa, for diversity and multiculturalism are fucking not an issue for them, right? How many times have you, how many African countries have you been to? How many Af Asian countries have you been to? How many times have you visited these places or spoken to people from them? How much research have you actually done? Because that statement you made where you say it's only a problem for us in white majority nations, right? It is objectively, with it is completely and utterly wrong on every level. It is bullshit, right? It is the statement that can only be made by someone who is, at best, just, you know, ill-informed or brainwashed or someone who's just incredibly stupid and full of hubris, or at worst, someone who has a nefarious agenda. Those are your options, mate, because there's no fucking argument about any of this. These pl these places around. If you honestly think that the world you live in is this is so much more different than the rest of the world, that the world that you can look on the fuck that you look around the world and you see Africa and you've got this image of Africa and everyone's the same and it's all homogenous. It's not. It is genetically and culturally the most diverse place on the f area in the fucking world, my friend. Right? And let's talk about immigration for a second. Right? You look at immigration. Right, here's another map for you. Which country has the most fucking immigrants? Now, as you see there, there's a lot of diversity in Africa. And there's a lot of places, uh, as a percentage of a population, you'll see that definitely America and Europe have got more immigration. Yes, we do. But we're nowhere near the most. In fact, we ain't even in the fucking top ten. We ain't nowhere near the fucking top ten. In fact, there's barely any fucking European countries in the top ten of the most of countries with the highest population of immigrants. The, the countries, here are the top 10 countries who have the most immigrants. Luxembourg, Singapore, Bahrain, Monaco, Macau, Andorra, Liechtenstein, and the top three, Kuwait, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates. The United Arab Emirates has over 80% population of immigrants. Think about that for a second. More than 80% of the population of the United Arab Emirates, nearly 80% of, of Qatar, 75% of Kuwait, over 60% of Liechtenstein. These places are thought that that's the percentage of immigrants, right? America still doesn't even anywhere near the bottom. In fact, if you look at the G8 nations, America has less than 15%. Germany has about the same with less than 15%, right? The UK has a bit less. The UK has a bit less. That's at 13.2. Japan, much smaller, only 1.6. Canada, 21.8. Italy, Italy, less than 10%. Right? So again, you want to talk about immigration? The amount of population of immigrants that we have compared to a shitload of other countries, we're nowhere near the fucking... We're nowhere near these people. We're fucking miles behind in terms of the amount of immigrants we have in and the amount of immigrants have. Now, granted, a lot of that is probably to do with the fact that some of these other countries, it's easier to get into than it is ours. But also a lot of it's to do with just where you fucking are in the world. You know, if you live in the Middle East or you live in Africa, America's a bit of a fucking long way to go, isn't it? Right? It's a bit of a fucking slog to get all the way to America. You've really only, you've only got two thick pissing countries, uh, two pissing areas bordering you, haven't you? So it's not going to be as easy to fucking get into America, 
Right? So again, this idea that you're fucking fu that America or Europe is suffering from this disease and no other country has it is objectively fucking wrong, right? And let's talk one more, and let's go to the final part, India. Uh, India has uh, speaks uh, the multitude of languages in India, right? It's uh, it's in, in terms of religious diversity, uh, it's in terms of religious diversity, it's fucking about 80% Hindu, it's about 14% Muslim, there's about 2% Christian. Again, demographics that are not too dissimilar from what we have over here. You could say that 80% is about 80% Christian in, a, in a America or in some European countries. 14% um, could, re you know, could represent, that could represent Sikhs and Hindus and Muslims. Right? Uh, you can, you know, it's all there. You know, it's about the same, it's about the same wherever you go. That's the fucking th thing about it. And you haven't fucking even... Have you, do you not know this? Did you look up, before you made that statement, did you look up what India was, what Indian demographics were? Here's an interesting thing. Right? Of all the languages listed in India, Hindi is the most popular at 41%. Bengali is spoken at 8.1%. Uh, Telugu at 7%. 7 Mathar... Uh, Marathi, Marathi at seven percent, and then all the rest go down. There's loads. There's Urdu. There's Urdu. There's Kannada. There's Malayama. There's all these different fucking languages. But here's the interesting thing to note about about uh, India, and I'll um I'll leave a link to this below. But let me read it for you now. English enjoys the status of subsid of, of subsidiary. English enjoys the status of subsidiary official language, but is the most important language for national, political, and commercial communication. Now that's very important. English, whilst it's not on the list of languages, anyone who wants to be involved in politics or involved in a business that makes national or international trades or communications has to learn to speak English. You'll notice that when uh, our, our politicians, when Donald Trump goes and meets all these foreign politicians, you'll notice that all of them speak fucking English, don't they? Do you know why? It's because they fucking have to. And yet, in America, in Britain, and other places, we piss and moan because street signs have got two different languages on them. Or because you go to the ATM and they, they, t they give you an option of what language do you want this fucking ATM to be in. And we piss and moan about that. Can you imagine the fucking, can you imagine the aneurysm that would be going on nationally in America if Donald Trump was told, right, Mr. Trump, you are now, uh, you are now President of the United States, you've got to learn fucking Urdu, mate. You, you just not. You just got to. You got to learn Urdu, Bengali, and Mandarin. Right? Otherwise, we're fucked. Can you imagine the outrage from like right wing media or, or, or the, you know, people like Fox News or people like the Daily Mail in this country? Can you imagine the pissing and moaning that would go on if we found out? If we were told that, well, if our children are going to grow up to fucking, uh, you know, be involved in politics or be involved in business, they're going to have to learn to speak fucking Malawi. We're going to have to fucking do it. They need to know Punjabi off the top of their fucking head. Can you imagine the fucking outrage that would be that, that would if that was the case? These people all do that and they get on with it, right? right? You want to talk about what makes your country so different and what makes majority white countries so different is that we are so pri we are actually privileged to be able to have to, to speak the language, to speak the language that we don't need to fucking learn all this shit. Right? And we feel threatened when other people who've made the effort to learn a second or third pissing language come over here and they don't use the words fully correctly because, you know, because learning two languages, three languages is fucking difficult. This is the fucking reality of the situation here, my friend. What you've said in that fucking tweet is not only just wrong, but it's, it's not just the language of white nationalist. It's the fucking, it's completely and utterly bullshit. And I want to go back to the final bit. You say, honestly, I don't give many shits about who lives where. How many shits do you give, Chris? But this is why I just want people to have consistent beliefs. What do you mean consistent beliefs? What you want the world to have a consistent belief. Is that what you want? Do you want me to fucking make uh, videos directed at Asia? Do you want me to make videos entitled, Oi, Asia, no. Is that what you want? I don't have a big audience in Asia, funnily enough. What do you want? Do you want them to be more like us or us to be more like them? And who is them? Who in Asia do you want us to be more like? Do you want us to be more like Russia or Turkey or Israel or China or North Korea or Japan, right? Or Kuwait or, or United Arab Emirates? Is that what you want? What do you mean consistent beliefs, right? Do you know what I want, Chris? I don't expect the world to ever accept one idea. And if that's what you want, you're wasting your fucking time, my friend. But here's what I want. 
What I want is to live in a world not where everyone's got consistent beliefs as uh, consistent with my own. Do you know what I fucking want? I want to live in a world where someone who feels that they've got the confidence and the you know the charisma to open their mouth and talk on important issues has also got the critical thinking skills and the skepticism to actually look up what they're saying before they fucking open their mouth on it that's what i want chris i want to live in a world chris where someone, before they type in, why is multiculturalism only a problem in white nations, whereas Africa and Asia and India, it's not a fucking, but it's only a problem that we have. I want them to have at least made the effort to go on this thing called Google and type in diversity in Asia. Enter. Religious and ethnic demographics in Africa. I, I That's the world I want to live in, Chris. But we don't, do we? We live in a world where people who just say things that they feel in their gut are true and they say them with confidence they get they get fucking lauded with fucking praise and applause whereas you know regressive cucks like me who actually look up shit and know about this stuff and have to make these ridiculously long videos i mean why can't i just sum it all up in under 5 minutes or 140 characters is that too much to fucking ask is that really so difficult yes it is because this ain't a fucking easy issue. This ain't a fucking... This ain't, this ain't a joke. Right? This isn't as simple as you want it to be or think it is. It's complicated. And when you boil it down to bullshit, like the kind of things you say, like when you're saying Asia and Africa and India being majority native, when they are actually not, when you do that, you are the person who is fucking destroying and making things meaningless. Right? It's not the person who calls you a racist unfairly or the person who calls you a white nationalist unfairly or the person who calls you a bigot unfairly who's ruining that word. It's you, right? You're ruining that word. You're ruining and rendering those words meaningless because you're choosing to speak like one. You are speaking at best like a bigot because you're making factual fucking inaccurate, factually inaccurate statements that have no bearing on reality and you're speaking as if they're fucking true. And that is a greater detriment to the future, and that is a greater fucking of the future than some than some than some fucking SJW who calls you a calls you a fucking a, a racist on Twitter. But hey, what would I know? I haven't taken the red pill. It's not salty enough for me. This is Richard the Dick Coughlin saying good night. May God be less.